Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to continue now with our second last speaker for the day, and somebody that I've become very fond of, fond of over the last few months, uh, having many Skype chats uh, all the way from Vienna, the wonderful Klaus Donner, and uh, we certainly have struck an interesting relationship, sharing interesting in bits of information about different artifacts and tools and things that we find in our respective little, um, you know, jobs that we do, roles that we fulfill. So Klaus is going to continue now with his part two of Unsolved Mysteries and take you on a continued journey of discovery with some of the phenomenal artifacts that he's been collecting for a long time now that really defy any kind of logic and force us to reconsider our human origins and our human history. So let's give a round of warm applause for Mr. Klaus Donner. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I have to say I'm very sad that I have to leave uh, tomorrow evening because the few days in your country were just wonderful. I met so many good friends and you live in a great country. Yesterday I was talking about giants, little people, human with uh, elongated skulls, uh, human and dinosaurs. Today I show you many so-called O parts, O parts like uh, the uh, out of place artifacts. Of course, I cannot give you any answers. Uh, a, few a few months ago, an American writer wrote a book about me uh, and she made the subtitle, Digging for Answers, Getting More Questions. And this is the reality. Uh, on some of the artifacts, we did uh, scientific researches. These results, I can easily explain you and tell you but uh, for many of the artifacts, there is no answer until now. Uh, a few years ago, when we tried to do the exhibition Unsolved Mysteries in Vienna, I, start, I studied uh, around, all, around the world, all the museums for strange artifacts, and finally we had a list of 356 pieces. A friend of mine, a museum director, wrote a lending request to all of his, to his colleagues. And out of these 356 uh, requests, we received only one agreement. Because museums, if they lend you some artifacts, they have to give you an explanation. And most of those, those pieces were also quite impossible to give an answer. So today, I start with uh, the age of human. On this photo, you see the footstep the positive and negative side of a footstep, human footstep, it looks like a shoe step, but uh, the scientists, of course, said immediately this is a natural formation, but the strange thing on this object is that you can see on the right side, here, uh, here and here, you can see a crashed, Trilobite. This is an animal which concerned the official scientists. Trilobites finally disappeared in the mass extension at the end of the Permian about 250 million years ago. And it's definitely that this uh, trilobite is crashed by a weight. So that's quite impossible that human cannot be 250 million years ago lived already. Here you have a better view, so you can see the positive and the negative side and the crashed trilobite. This is a human footstep found in the Palaxi River in Texas. There are a lot of these footsteps parallel with uh, dinosaurs' footsteps. And of course, the official announcement was immediately, this was done by the creationists, because there is the Creation Evidence Museum allocated very close to the Balaxi River. So they took out one of these footsteps and they sliced it into, uh, they cut it into slices and you could see on the inside, sorry, you could see that warm holes in the stone also had the same form like the footsteps, so it was impossible 
a fraud or a fake. But as these footsteps were parallel with human footsteps, uh, with dinosaurs' footsteps, that wouldn't have been possible. Age dating also there around over 100 million years. This is a petrified human hand uh, print, also in a, uh, petrified, and uh, also the age dating should be over 50, 60 million years. So is it reality that we human only are until now over one million year old, or did human live already long, long time ago? This iron cup was found in the United States in a coal mine, and it was enclosed in a big uh, stone brick. And when they broke this piece of coal inside, was this metal, this iron cup. And you can see that the pressure of the petrification of the coal uh, put some part of the coal directly into the iron and deformed it. The age dating of the coal in the area where it was found, geological uh, age, is 65 million years. This is a petrified human finger, and they cut it also into pieces before they did some uh, x-rays. And you could see that the inside, where the bone is, is much uh, stronger than the area where the meat was, and you can see even the fingernail. These pieces are presented in uh, Glen Rose at the uh, Creation Evidence Museum. Here you see a monastery in Colombia, the Santo Ecce Homo Monastery was built 1620. The area in Villa de Leva, that's the place uh, called uh, Villa de Leva, is full with uh, fossils. The whole area you can find big fossils, small fossils, and the padres, the fathers, uh, used some of the fossils for the construction and from the, uh, for the floor of the monastery. On this picture, you see a great researcher from Colombia, Professor Jaime Gutierrez. On this picture, you see a petrified pineapple. Here, you see an avocado. Here, it's a bigger photo. This is a mice, petrified mice. And this is Father Huerta. He is triple professor, professor for archaeological plants, professor for plants, and anthropologist. He found in the area of Via de Leva many petrified, cultivated fruits and vegetables. In his hand, he is holding a, a cocoa and a petrified banana. That means uh, there must have lived human because animals, or if there are so many uh, fossils, dinosaurs wouldn't have been able to cultivate fruits and vegetables. Here you see a close-up of the cocoa and the banana. This is a pinos, and they built up a small museum close to Via de Leva, showing all these petrified, cultivated fruits and vegetables. Here is Padre Huertas with uh, human, I, I, sorry, I cannot read it on the picture, I forgot the name of this bone. Uh, you can see that this one is much bigger, it's about 20 centimeters, so these human living there must have been also bigger than we are in our days. Also petrified this bone. On this picture, on the left side, you can see a human uh, hand, and on the right side, 
a human food. We did a lot of researches on this piece, also in the United States was done a lot of researches, and the result was that this is a human hand and a human foot, fossiled in a stone plate, and geological dating of this stone from the area of Via de Leva is about 120 to 140 million years. This is a close-up of the petrified hand. Close to this area of Via de Leva, they found petrified bones with end carvings of strange animals. On this close-up photo, you can see that on the right feet, there is a kind of, uh, of a ring, arm ring. So that's very strange because those pieces are definitely bone. It was researched, uh, it was checked in uh, Bogota at the university, petrified bone, but uh, it takes a long, long time that bone really petrifies. But uh, the strange thing is that even this animal has uh, a um, decoration on, on the feet. And here you see also three bones decorated with, uh, with ink carvings. And all these three animals do not live in our days in South America. They don't know what kind of animals these were. And all three uh, pieces are petrified. You can see the wonderful end carvings in the big uh, skull plate of an unknown animal. This is the front view, and definitely these three animals, they do not live in our days, and they are unknown in South America, especially in Colombia, where the pieces were found. Yesterday I showed photos from uh, the collection of Dr. Cabrera, the so-called Ickerstone collection, but they found also some encarved stones in Colombia. And on that photo, you can see a bed with a tail. And at the end of the tail, there is a kind of leaf, which we found also on many of the stones of uh, Dr. Cabrera in Peru, Ica. A bed with uh, a tail is also unknown in the scientific world in South America. This piece I wanted to show you because it's a wonderful done piece. It shows four faces on the front side, left side, right side, and on the back side. And on top, you can see a snake. And this is also very interesting because all over the world on unexplainable or strange artifacts, we always can find a snake. This is El Invernito. It's Concerning the archaeologists, 1,000 years old Muisca Observatory. The Muiscas were the indigenous in uh, the old time in uh, Colombia. Uh, all these uh, pieces were cut down by the conquistadors, so it was definitely an archaeological and astronomical site. And I personally think this place, the stone monuments are much, much older. It's the same with your stone circles here in South Africa. Uh, how is it possible to say that those pieces or these uh, monuments are 1,500 years old? Because it's impossible to make an age dating on stones. So it's, it's a big question mark. There is also inside this area a, bear, a very big uh, cave. And on top of the cave is a huge stone plate, very, very heavy. And the material of these stones and also of big uh, phalluses up to eight meters is about 65 kilometers far from the place where they are now. And they had to transport them over several mountains without streets, without anything. So it's a big question, how could they do these transportations? In 
Colombia, there is a place where they found many stone caves, stone monuments, huge ones. And this is one of these pieces. It's about one meter in size. And it doesn't look really like any known South American pre-Columbian culture. Uh, at the area, I saw personally several huge statues with the long T's, two long T's on the left side and right side. And one day I received from Chinese archaeologists from southern Mongolia some photos with very strange round pyramids. And also they found in this area the same size uh, stone monuments with exactly the same faces and also exactly the two teeth. So that means was it just a coincidence that they had the same idea or was there in the long, long past uh, a connection between southern Mongolia and even Colombia? But we found many, many pieces you will see further on, which gives us the idea, we cannot prove it of course, that once there existed a global civilization on our earth. This is a close up. They found also in this area these kind of pyramids. On one side on this piece you can see a monkey and on the other side, as I said before, a snake. So the snake for our ancestors must have had a very important uh, role. This is another piece from this area and the face, as you can see, does not look like uh, in, uh, no, a South American Indian. And especially this one, it's a very strange one. Uh, the whole piece, the mask is about this size and it's a very heavy stone, but it's a perfect work. The question is, which civilization existed in Colombia a long time ago. And it's strange because as I showed you before, in this area they found petrified, cultivated fruits, vegetables, and even human petrified bones. This is one of the most interesting pieces I ever saw. And I could present those pieces also found in Colombia close to Bogota, in the area where the Muiscas lived. And the Colombian archaeologists did research on the pieces and they pointed all these pieces out as new done artifacts. And the interesting, the, for me the most interesting and funny story is, when we got these pieces to Vienna, I had the allowance from Professor Gutierrez and he was with me. We went to the Natural Historical Museum in Vienna, to the Mineralogical Institution, and they did a perfect result on the material. And the material of this one and the following artifacts is lutite. Lutite is a very hard stone. It has the hardness nearly like granite, but the problem is that this stone structure is like leaves. So we did the material check first, and then I asked uh, Dr. Distelberger, who is known in the uh, world of museums worldwide as the expert on stone and precious stone work, and he checked those pieces, especially this one, we call it genetical disc, and after checking all the pieces, he told me, I cannot tell you how they did these pieces. I cannot tell you when they made these pieces. And of course, I cannot tell you who made those pieces. But the only thing I can tell you, we are not able today to make the same pieces from the same material. So I, Professor Gutierrez was very happy, me too, because if those pieces would have been accepted by the Colombian archaeologists, they wouldn't have landed uh, me for the exhibition. So I was happy that for the official uh, archaeologists in Colombia, those pieces are new done. I got it for the exhibition. But how can you make a new piece if the most expert is saying that we are not able to do the same pieces from the same material? The interesting thing on this so-called genetical disc, which is a perfect work. 
is this, is this place. Because here you can see human eggs with and without spermia. So that means the people who did this artifact, they must have had at least a microscope because human eggs and human spermia, you would not able to see with your own eyes. And there are also many strange things on this side of the plate. And on the other uh, this you can see a Swedish uh, photographer did with a microscope camera inside a woman a photo. And the photo looks like this human egg with spermia inside and without spermia. On the back side of the plate, you see man, fem uh, woman, and child on, on the right side, here. And this is very strange. And Professor Gutierrez's idea is, or his, his thinking, I personally do not agree with, but his, his, his meaning is, that this is the presentation, the, the evolution from frog to human. And we found even very old library material from China that some of the researchers in long, long time ago, they also were writing uh, about the evolution from, from um, not evolution, sorry, the, the Darwinism, like uh, the changement from uh, animal to human. I do not agree, but the only strange thing for me is, if people are able to do such a wonderful work, showing also on this side of the plate, uh, the fetus in different stage of growing, why did they not show a real human face? Why? did they show white skull with round eyes. We found also many, many pieces in southern Mongolia, age dating by the geologists there, is between six and 8,000 years, jade figurines, and they also are presented with very big round eyes. We do not have any answer for these questions. This is a tile Professor Gutierrez thinks it was a kind of weapon because it fits exactly your hand and you can hit something with a button. This is a bed with a tail. And you saw before the sto hand-carved stone also showing a bed with a tail. This is also made out of the same material lutite. And uh, Dr. Distelberger said, Lydite would break immediately even with the finest uh, uh, technology if you try to carve it or form it. So it's quite impossible. And he said, we would not be able to do the same piece from the same material. And wondering is, look how precise and how perfect these pieces were done. And it's so great that anybody can hold it in his hand. If it's a child, if it's a woman or a big man, it would fit definitely every size of hand. So Professor Gut uh, Gutierrez is uh, Colombia's most famous industrial designer and architect. And he said he is taking many ideas of those old artifacts and once when he made a presentation and he showed these pictures in United States at the university, one student asked him, Professor Gutierrez, as I know, you are the most famous industrial designer and architect. Couldn't it be that you did these artifacts? And he was laughing and he said, young man, if I would be able to do these artifacts, this perfect design out of stone, I wouldn't be only the most famous 
industrial designer in Colombia, but I would be the most famous worldwide. This is another piece from the same collection. And also here you can see it fits exactly your hand. That's another one. This is the front side and back side. It shows a woman with a child and on the right side, a hunter, the man. You can see this piece in original, it is this size. And you could put this piece, you see the form, you can put it exactly on your thumb and you put your finger on it and it is exactly like your own finger. So that means you could put any, you could find any point. It's like you put your finger on something. Professor Gutierrez thinks that it, these tiles were used for modeling of gold uh, uh, pieces. I think more of these pieces were used for medical uh, things. <clears throat> All those pieces are very small and they have even curves, which definitely would be impossible to do with the same material because as I said, it's, its form is like, lutite form is like leaves and it would break even with the finest smooth thing smoothest machine, it would immediately break. And even the small pieces are precisely and perfect in design. I mean, doing something with a material which even we are not able to do in our days, and then the design so precise what civilization was that? That's a very, very big question. And all these pieces, of course, are not connected to any known pre-Columbian culture. Here you have photos and you can see each piece is perfectly fitting any hand. This is very interesting, same material. It's a knife and it looks like it was done by an advanced civilization for an unadvanced civilization because the using is already encarved in the handle. You see on top mother's head, you see the child, and the, when it's born, the mother's uh, line is around the neck and the baby must, uh, uh, could die. So you see the arrow going down so that means if problem at the birth of a baby, you should use this knife to cut the string with the mother. And this we call it the, the birth spoon because on the front side, you can see the vagina and the baby's head is coming out, but the baby might have problem to come out from the mother. So on the back side, you can only put here this finger inside and you are only able to, to hold this piece with two fingers. That means that you would not be able to, to, take, uh, to use help with power. And when we had this piece in Vienna, I asked some uh, ladies doctors, if they can check this piece, and they did it, and finally the answer was, it might be even safer than the instruments we are using in our days, because sometimes in our days, if there's a problem with the, with the born of a baby, they use a special material, and sometimes uh, the baby's head uh, could be damaged or, or insured. So, Again, a very, very advanced technology and civilization. And again, these pieces, they are perfect in design, as you can see on this picture. And also some pieces here, in, and you can see it looks like a chair. I made a joke and I said, it looks like the dentist chair. And you say, you can see the person sitting on it 
has a very different phase like we do have in our days. And again, my question always is, why didn't they show a really face if they are able to do such wonderful work out of this material? So of course there are people who immediately would say that was done by aliens, but I always say as long as I don't have the approval, I would never even, even say so. That's another stone. It looks like uh, Ark Noah. I always made a joke and said it looks like Ark Noah because on the back side you have all kind of animal. And on top of this stone, there is an animal which does not exist in our days. And the same animal I saw on several stoneworks in South America, in Ecuador, and in Colombia. This is another stone found also in Colombia. You can see on top a smiling face with a bird. You can see some symbols. On the left side is an animal face. On the other side you have also a kind of symbols. And on, on the bottom, Sorry, I forgot to include the photos. On the bottom was a kind of crocodile, bit, but with a very different tail, like a crocodile in our days. Here you have on the left side, my thinking is it's showing the duality and two pyramids, one on top and down. And for us, the interesting thing was the writing on this side. And the same writing and similar writing we found on stones in Ecuador, in Colombia, in Illinois, United States, in Glossel in France, in Malta, Mediterranean, in Turkmenistan, and even in Australia. So for me, it's very hard to say what it is, but it, I think there existed a real global civilization long, long time ago. And if you take the words of the Bible, until the building of the Tower of Babel, they used one language. And it's a very pity because in every country, these stones with these unknown writings are not recognized. In France, the first, a huge collection, a farmer found it already in 1924, and until our days, his collection is not accepted by the official archaeologists. And on the other side of this stone, you can see again four looking like, like frogs. And also the frog played a very important role in the past, in South America, in China, in Asia. So we are still trying to find information about the importance of the frog in the past. It's also very strange. The body itself is an animal, and on top you have the face with long ear and horns. And when I checked those pieces, Professor Gutierrez told me that these pieces have a very, very strong energy. And I handled the pieces, I made the measurements and everything. And that in that night, when I returned to the hotel, it was about 10 o'clock in the evening, it was quite cold in, in Bogota around this time and the, the room was not so warm. So I was a little bit freezing, but around midnight, I walked up, my heart was beating like hell and I was sweating and I decided these pieces, whenever I get them for an exhibition, I wouldn't handle them for a long time. This is one of the stones found in Colombia. Professor Gutierrez made a check and he said that left side, right side, and in the mouth, they had in the past uh, precious stones, but the grave robbers, they took them surely out. The return side, Again, this unknown writing. That's another stone. This is completely different. It's again from, uh, made out of lutite. And you can see that the left side and the right side is 
different. Here you have the moon and the sun on it, and again the unknown writing. And that's again an important and interesting stone because on the front side you have a man and a bird, and again this writing. And on the, here you see it in a close-up. Oh, sorry. And on the return side you have again this animal which does not exist in our days. This is one of the most beautiful pieces. It's also made out of lutite. And I think on this stone are presented two different writings. The left side, as you can see, is completely different with the left side. And the one with the red inlays, these are corals. So it would be interesting, of course, if someone would be able one day to decipher this writing. Here you can see a deer and symbols, and on top again you see this strange animal. So this animal must have been very important for this civilization in the past. Here again, a man, and again this strange animal. Now we are going to United States, Illinois, 1984. Colonel uh, Russell Burroughs, an American former army member, he was searching for metal pieces from, from the war in the countryside and suddenly he fell into a hole and he found an underground tunnel. He wrote a book about it and you can see here on this picture his explanation in his book. He explained that he found uh, burial chambers with sarcophagus inside made out of stone and when he opened one he explained that the inside sarcophagus was made out of pure gold. He also said that he found thousands of stones within carving with approximately the same writing than we saw before. And when he brought some of the stones to, the, to some of the museums for checking, they just told him that these artifacts are frauds, new done. So after a while he started to selling pieces and I know that until our days he sold around 5,000 pieces and he brought out also gold and they melted the gold. He was working with two colleagues and two of the colleagues passed away with a heart attack and Russell Burroughs himself had three uh, how you call it, three, three heart operations. But as he was a former army man, he was of course much better in condition than his two colleagues. And Dr. Distelberger, the expert, told me without knowing about history when I, old, uh, when I asked him what happens if you melt uh, old gold. He said this is very dangerous because melting old gold makes a toxin which can attack your heart. And another good friend uh, in Switzerland, he was the editor-in-chief of a big newspaper. He did a strong research in Switzerland and he found out that there is a bank account with five million US dollars running on three names and one of it is Russell Burroughs. So he blown up the entrance of this uh, underground tunnel system and I can understand why because if this cave would be announced and accepted, first of all found and then opened and accepted, as an archaeological find, he would have a big trouble with United States government. One day he, he uh, accepted uh, a, question, a request from uh, Wayne May, he is the editor of a magazine called Ancient American, to show him the tunnel system. And he brought him to the area. He asked him to pay him $10,000, then he will show him the underground uh, cave. And at the place itself, he decided not showing him the place. But at this moment, Wayne May knew approximately where this underground tunnel system is. He called 
um, ground penetrate radar expert, and here you can see what they found. This is the drawing by Russell Burroughs, and this is what they found out, but they had heavy metal hits on the places where Russell Burroughs mentioned that they, he found gold sarcophagus. And here he was describing that it, it was broken down, but this underground tunnel system goes further on until underground a mountain where the radar couldn't uh, get any result anymore. So since that, Wayne made it already three tests, uh, thrilling, but they always found water. So he, he, I called him a few months ago, and he said that this year they have another place, and they did another radar, uh, ground penetrate radar, and he is quite sure that they can open the cave. That would be an imp uh, unbelievable find, because I have some of those stones, because as they are not original, if something is not original and I'm able to buy it, I buy it. Here you can see a land map, and you can see exactly in this, in this area is the Burr's Cave. There are also portraits encarved in some of those stones, and this one, again, if someone looks at this, he would say that looks like an astronaut. I say, I don't know what it is, because there are many, many other stones. This is, looks like Egyptian. This looks like European lady. And always this unknown writing. There was one man who deciphered, who could translate this language. It was Professor Schildmann, the president of the German Linguistic, Linguistic Society. He spoke and wrote and translated more than 40 languages. And he said that this writing has a light similarity to the Indus Valley and to the Easter Island writing. And he called it pre-Sanskrit because he said it's definitely the oldest writing. He passed away a few years, and now is one Italian professor able to translate this language. And I can show you that he really can translate it on a, in, on a few pictures after. This is one of the marble plates Russell Burroughs brought out from this cave. And here you can see two symbols. Here and here. And I found the same symbols on papers from church, uh, from James Churchward, a British man who did researches in, he worked in India for the army and he got friend with some priests of a temple and they showed him plates, golden plates, and the translation was talking about the sinking of the continent Mu or Lemuria. And uh, Churchward got friend with uh, William Neven. William Neven found uh, 1873 uh, in the Valley of Mexico uh, under three layers, three different civilizations, and the most advanced was the deepest one, and over this uh, layer was volcano ash, and the last volcano in this area was approximately 10 to 12,000 years. So the story about Mu Atlantis, I believe in it. It's not only a legend. This looks perfectly Egyptian. This could be Egyptian, but also with this unknown writing. This is another finding. Uh, this piece they found in a mound in the United States. It's an Egyptian Ushapti. This is a small stone plate showing Nuit, Egyptian god, also found in an American mound. And here you have the next following pieces. They were found in Calabria, in Italy, and an Italian professor could translate it, and the translation of this plate, which you see on this photo, was telling about the graves of the sea kings, 
and it was a description where is a mastodont a, 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 an ele before elephant and also a stone circle. And a friend of mine, Adriano Forgione, upon the description, he found these places. He found the mastodont statue, stone statue. He found the stone circle. And with ground penetrate radar, they also found underground tunnel system. But they are not allowed to open them. So I have to be a little faster, because otherwise I run out of time. Sorry. I just show you these pictures. And here we are in Ecuador, in uh, South America. This we call the, the, the Stone World Map. On this side, you can see the Mediterranean, Italy, Greek, here is Egypt, Saudi Arabia, this is India. And as you heard yesterday from Mr. Graham Hancock, he was showing on the map India, and he was talking that they found uh, underground monuments, and he wrote it also in his book, Sunken Cities After the Last Tsunami. And on this so-called world map, you can see that on this uh, ink carving, India is bigger than in our days, and also here, Thailand is also much bigger in our days. Also here, where Japan Islands and Taiwan is, Professor Kimura, who does the, uh, the researches on the stone monument, which was presented wonderful yesterday by Mr. Graham Hancock. Uh, he explained to me that he found out upon his researches that one, there was a long continent existing from the northern Japanese islands, now Russia, the Sakhalin Islands, until far down Taiwan. So this would be exactly like shown here on this map. And uh, around the location of Israel, or Middle East here, there is an inlay of an eye. And this is a natural quartz line going around the stone. The stone is 350 kilos heavy, and it's quartz uh, granite. This is a close-up of the eye inlay. And on the other side, the quartz line passes the Atlantic, and here you have a continent which does not exist in our days. And on the Piri Race map, which was also presented yesterday by Mr. Graham Hancock, you can see around the same place a round marking on the Piri Race map. And that marking, I hope Mr. Hancock can agree with me, is around the location where this round mark is on the Piri Race map. So for me, this uh, ink carving would show Atlantis. Then it passes South America and ends up in the area where today uh, is the location, the Bay of Guayaquil. Then you can see here an inlay and a round inlay again. And this is the place where this stone map and other 350 pieces were found 1984 by an, in, by an Ecuadorian uh, engineer. He was in charge for a British mining company. They did gold mining. And he found these 350 pieces in an underground tunnel. You will see some of the pieces uh, further on. But the most interesting thing is that at the same place, they found two wells with the best water on earth because I brought one stem bottles or a one and a half liter plastic bottles with me in a, in a carton box. And when I checked in in uh, Guayaquil airport, I was uh, asked to go to a separate rain, uh, room. And there were standing 15 policemen and military around my luggage. And an officer of the Interpol asked me if this is my luggage. And you can believe at the first moment I thought I didn't pack the, the carton box. I thought somebody put me something inside and that means 25 years goodbye. So I said, yes, this is my luggage. He said, what is inside the carton box? I said, 10 one and a half liter bottles with Ecuadorian water. He said, 
take it out. So I took one by one bottle out, and when I saw that there's nothing inside, the first time I really felt, thank you. Then he asked me, put it back again. I put it, no, then he was looking, and he made a telephone call. And about five minutes later, a doctor came with an empty, inje empty injection. And he took one, a water out of one of the bottles, and I thought, wow, they put something inside the water. Now, they, something is wrong. So he went away. After 30 minutes, he came. He talked with the Interpol officer. Then he asked me to put the bottles back again, and he put the carton box again three, four times through the scanner, and then he said, I can leave. So I left, and when we arrived in Vienna, I, was, I forgot the situation in Guayaquil, and I, went, I, I tried to leave the airport uh, at the place without declaring anything, because I didn't have anything. So left side, right side, two policemen asked me to come with them. So I went with them, and they asked me again, what is inside, and I said, water from Ecuador. I had the problem already with Interpol. So one officer asked me, what did you do in Ecuador? I said, I made research for an exhibition. He said, what kind of exhibition? I said, I did uh, 2001, an exhibition, Unsolved Mysteries. He said, wow, you did the exhibition? I said, yes, why? He said, I went there two times with my wife. Great, did you find something? I said, yes, I have the bones of a 7.6 meter giant in my luggage. So he was laughing, but I really had the bones in my luggage. And then he showed me, he, sh he said, look, if you put 10 one and a half liter bottles in a carton box and you put this box into the scanner and you make a photo, you have to see the shadows of the plastic bottles. So he put the carton box inside, he did the photo, he said, look, I looked, the screen was black. He said, you didn't make a photo? He said, I did. That's why we picked you up, we don't know what is because there is nothing showing up. And later on, we found out that this water has gold and silver colloidal in nanomicroscopic form, which is incredible. And it has natural energy, which mixed up the scanner. So let's go ahead. The same place, they found the so-called pyramid with a shining eye. The pyramid has 13 steps and an inlay of an eye. The natural color is gray light gray, and if you put this uh, pyramid under ultraviolet light, it shines like a really strong eye, but not like a human eye. This symbol you saw this morning already, uh, it's on the one dollar note, it's connected with Illuminati, it's connected with uh, Freemasons, but I personally think, first of all, who was able to do such land map into a stone showing two continents not existing in our days. And second, I think this pyramid is much, much older than the Illuminatis and the Freemasons and everyone, uh, everyone. This is a picture, it's not so good because it's quite difficult to do a perfect picture with the shining of the eye, but it really looks very strange. And on the bottom of the pyramid, you have the inlay of the Orion, and the same writing you saw before on the other stones from Burroughs Cave and Calabria. The translation of uh, Professor Schildmann was, the son of the creator comes. Here you see on this stone, the two eyes, and the right hand is holding the pyramid and the left hand on top of the pyramid. This is the stone, a man sitting on, on a stone, he is holding the pyramid. From his eyes are going rays to two boat persons. And on his head, he has something looks, which looks like a helmet and an antenna going up to this uh, symbol. And here is the helmet. And you can see that in the middle of the helmet, something was broken away. Next time, when I get this piece to Europe, we do a material check. Another collection also found at the same place is a big uh, jade cup with 12 little jade cups. The numbers on, on the 12 little cups are looking like the Mayan numbers, but they are different, a little bit different. 
And the strange thing is that in, on the big cup is an inlay of a star constellation. And the big cup inside is very magnetical outside, nearly nothing, only on one place outside. It's very magnetical. It's exactly in the center of the three stars. And if you fill plain all 12 cups and you fill it very carefully in the big cup, the big cup is completely full. And geologists were telling me that it's impossible that a cup, a stone cup, is magnetically only from one side, from inside, and not from outside. If there is iron material in the stone, it must be definitely magnetically from both sides. This is a close-up of the big cup. You can see the star constellation, and all these stars are also inlay of a material which brightly shines under ultraviolet light. You can see it here on this picture. This is another jade plate with the same star constellation as on the big cup, and two persons, two figurines with square heads looking up to the stars. Also, the inlays shining under black light. This is also same collection, same finding, a stone which is, is uh, destroyed here and partly here. It was the heart form, and this shows a face with closed eyes, with a nose, with a bird, and long hair. And some of my friends, when they looked at this picture in close-up on the big screen, they said, it looks like the Shroud of Turin. So, you have now one big, sky, uh, big cup, you have 12 small cups, you have a hard form stone showing a face which could look like the Shroud of Turin. You have the writing, in an unknown writing, the son of the creator come. So I could make a very hot story saying this is the grail because this is connected with Israel. I would never do so because I'm sure it is not so. This is the reverse side of the, the same stone. Also same finding, a cobra head. Cobra never existed in South America. And on the, uh, the, the back side of the cobra head, you have 33 inlay, inlays, and left side, right side, seven inlays. Also, the inlays are shining very strong under ultraviolet light. This shows the Kundalini, the sexual energy is going up on the back of the man to the third eye. Kundalini doesn't exist in the past in South American culture, pre-Columbian culture. This is a kind of helmet. You can put it on your shoulders or you can lay your head inside. And the inlays here also shining under ultraviolet light. And some uh, acupuncture specialists told me that these are exactly the energy points on the backside of the skull which they are using for acupuncture. Also the inlays shining under black light. You can see how this piece could be used. And in the same ground a few months ago they found an unfinished piece like this. Then several other pieces, a pyramid stone, again showing the pyramid with the eye and unknown symbols. Here again the Orion, and again a pyramid with the eye. And many statues uh, showing definitely not any pre-Columbian culture because the lotus seat and the kind of head decorations and an, an Indian professor sent me an information, she wrote, this position is called as Padma Asan in yoga in India. The Lord Shiva is a Hindu god, and he has a snake around his neck. So where does those pieces really come? I don't know. And the cobra, the cobra head has 30 line, 33 lines in carved in the Hindu mythology. There are 33 god and goddess, the seven circles represent sap chakras in yoga. I have to finish because I do not want to make uh, Mr. Graham Hancock wait because I myself am waiting for his speech. I thank you very much and maybe one day I come again to hear.